Nocturne. It's possible you can see someone from a distance after all these years and stop in your tracks or do a double take and wonder if maybe it's just someone who looks like someone you used to know or if it's the real person and then you walk on by like in the song walk on by and then you turn turn again but the person's gone and all you can do is haul yourself up to the roof and jump off or shoot yourself in the foot so that you can't walk can't move and time hangs heavy as you sit in your room and wonder if that person was him or you or someone's twin who arrived from another planet to savor the lilac scent that radiates from your skin. And the heat comes up from the pipes like Les Trois Dinipudés by Eric Satie and I turn the key without biting my tongue and the heart comes back on until it bleeds and I take back with one hand what I gave with the other and someone comes in off the street, no longer invisible, and the kissing booth closes for the night and I display my dishrag abs to the wind one last time, feel my skin on fire as I descend. right here in the corner of Katz's. Katz's is one of the longest establishments that exist still down here that hasn't been gentrified out. It was been here since about 1888, according to the sign here. Now what's really interesting about this sign is, is that it's a map. It's, uh, it's what used to be here, under the pig, which is gone. Max Fish, uh, which has gone off of this block, it did come back eventually. Uh, TG-170 is gone. Uh, Amy Downs is gone, Mary Adams is gone, Byron Monday is gone, 113 Parties is gone. This is all up and down like Ludlow here. Uh, Stewart Park High School obviously is still there, but it's gone through a different configuration. Uh, Gertel's Bakery is gone, uh, Gus's Pickles is gone, uh, Delancey Street is still here. So the only permanent thing here other than the streets and cats is from this side is Clayton, which is me. So here we are, uh, and I'm still here, but if you go through this map, these are all small businesses, and it's almost impossible now to run a small business in New York. About a poet, you might say, he's really good at being alone. He might lie low with your head hanging down, or look up at a shirt on a door that smells of her and say, she's gone. He might cry either way, but one feels better. I don't see it that way, she said on the phone. It's the truth, I said. I'm vanishing. Do you do it for love? I write poetry totally, 100% for love. There's no other reason to write poetry than for love. Um, I mean, sometimes love is a job, sometimes love is work. Sometimes somebody asks you to write a poem for their wedding. Um, but I would only do that for somebody I loved or um, somebody who paid me a lot of money. Patricia, 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 these are the words that I said. If neither one of us comes out alive, it's certain our love must be dead. Patricia! 
Patricia, what's going through your head? Patricia, 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 hiding your head in the cloud. You took me to the amusement park. Now who is laughing out loud? Patricia, come out from the crowd. I knew the way she combed her hair. That she was glad, she was mighty glad to have me there. And I was very glad she Hey, hey, hey. Patricia, 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 these are the words that I said. If neither one of us comes out alive, it's certain our love must be dead. Patricia, what's gone through your head? I love, I love that phase of Andy Warhol's career where he was, he had patrons and he wrote, he he made portraits for rich people, and I'd be thrilled if rich people asked me to write poems for them. But I'd be very happy to do that. So, but so far I do it for love, and even if rich people ask me to write poems for them, I'd probably love them too. A tough, a tough denim. denim. But I also think life's too short. Now. Do you see any parallels between the arts, like poetry and music? Well, this is New York, and there's always been this great alliance between poetry and painting, for sure. And I think it's a healthy one, and I think it's a good one, uh, particularly for the poets. Because I think what a lot of poets in this town are into, uh, they're, they're inspired by a great deal of what's, what's on canvas, or what's going on with the painters. You know. Do you have to go far for inspiration for your poetry? No, I just close my eyes. No inspiration. Uh, I don't. I don't find that a problem. I'll do something. Here. Do as well. Oculus. Uh, Oculus is just the Latin word for eye. But most of the paintings that I've done have to do with uh, thoughts about vision and visual perception. But the Oculus group is the most recent. It involves, well, Oculus generally means the, it's the Latin word for eye, but it also means the tip of the dome of the Pantheon in Rome. And it's also used to describe other round windows and uh, architectural elements. Most of the work derives from a purely artistic internal model. Uh, rather than using objects or uh, scenes from the virtual world, it derives from the imagination. And the search here is primarily for language. And that's to facilitate images that I have not seen. Uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein said to invent a language is to invent a form of life. I primarily think of it as a field in which I'm free to do what I have not seen before. And the form is derived primarily from the layering of paint in the automatic sense. Automatic meaning... Uh, without conscious planning or independent of an external influence. Do you use spray paint? No, after a long period of time of working, I use oil paint because it best reflects 
uh, these ideas I have about the layering of paint and the drying times. I use paint with an extremely light touch and a variety of brushes. So the effect is one that where the layering is uh, omnipresent, but uh, for the most part translucent. The works ultimately involve the process of seeing the image in your mind's eye and then painting it out, as it were. Uh, the discipline becomes always holding to the image inside. Always, always holding, holding to the, to the image, image inside. inside. You know, the genius behind uh, New York was cheap rent and inexpensive lifestyle. Uh -huh. And what that meant was people could come here, and just about all of the great contributors that came here really started off, um, you know, kind of really on a basic level and somewhat uh, in need of money. Whether that be Madonna or Cyndi Lauper or Jimi Hendrix or people that lived here, uh, Jackson Pollock, Rothko, none of them started off as rich. And then, um, you know, some of the only ways to make it out of the inner city really is with um, art, music, or sports. Hey. You ready to do some serious work? Let's talk some filmmaking. So let's see where we're at in this process. We're about, uh, what would you say, about 20 to 30 percent in? It's going to be a lot about iPhones and uh, online dating. So we have a kind of a running theme. You tell me what's in the can. You tell me what's going to be in the can, and we'll try to figure something out. What's in the can? We got the park people. All right. The Tompkins Square Park. We got the squirrels. Yeah, we got Frank, uh, the painter. We have a lot of my poetry. All right. We love those disclaimer TV ads with all the stuff that can go wrong with you if you take this little pill. The real nomads in New York are the, the true New York artists. We want to touch on their lives. We want to touch on their work. And little questions like, are they happy? These are the nomads of New York. We're all nomads of New York. All right. Sometimes I'm inspired to write a poem or a line comes into my head. But again, it's more, it does tend to start with a line rather than a feeling. People tend to think that if you're funny, you're not serious. Okay. Baseball wife. She's thinking about him. 
He is thinking about scoring. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> and on the corner here we have uh, luxury uh, Ludlow uh, apartments. It was Ludlow Street where people like Lou Ree started off paying $38 a month to be in a loft. So out of that $38, what did the city get for that $38? We got Lou Reed. Well, I think Lou Reed has really given more to society than, let's say, a McDonald's has. What mediums are you using? Uh, it's probably acrylic and gouache and India ink and oil paint and wax. So I'm just, what I'm doing is I'm fine-tuning now between pictures and words and objects going around because the title of the whole thing is freestanding sentence. You know? Uh-huh. I like this painting. I'm very fond of this particular picture. I don't know why. Does it surprise you when you're working on, a, let's say, a portrait, and you have to think, what, what's going to top this off? How can I add to this that will make it the way I want it? And a, a material will just come up that you weren't thinking of before. That ever happened? Sure. I mean, yeah. I grab whatever is available and try to, it's all a big repair job. This kind of format, is that wax? What is that? Play-Doh. Play-Doh. From the dollar store. And not even real Play-Doh. Have you ever worked with Play-Doh before? No. But I like the color. <laughs> but you needed something to prop up your quotation. Yeah, exactly. And the, the ticket pins the, the, that are holding the different words? Yeah. They go usually in cheese at the deli with the price on them. Uh-huh. Know what I mean? String bean? You asked how you could get some of these from the cheese store? I went to the restaurant supply and said, I need some ticket pins. Ticket pins. That's the refreshing nature of uncertainty. And when, when one restaurant didn't have them, I went to another place. And I finally found them. In Manhattan? Yeah. But most delis use them. So I knew that you had to be able to buy them. You, you go into any big delicatessen and look at their kind of food display, and you will find them. The most impressive buildings in Europe are cathedrals, and in America, banks. A coincidence of manner surrounds the fisted work, glum offices, and current rate of exchange. In the latitude and longitude of exploitation, feeble frames with lingering names ache an incomplete carnality, greet their mornings with hostility. Despair is the empty emotion. A cramped bed, some drizzling sunlight, the speaking clock, your yawning mind. Too often, liberty looks like cowardice. Freedom comes unintentionally when the mind rises to meet the chosen occupation necessary for survival. There is no sudden awakening. There is no greatness in death when a martyr longs for his cross. Something I, you know, and they're all writing poetry. Some of it's great. You know, it's bad poetry, but some of it is great bad poetry. So, um, you know, poetry is very complex. I mean, the elite 
it tends to elitize itself. You know, the academic poets have their whole gambit going where they're really the elite because they use these words that who knows what they are, you know. Words like adamantine. You know, once you've got adamantine in a poem, face it, you know, the story's over, you know. That's about it. You've got 19 people to read it in Connecticut, and there goes uh, your uh, poetry. But, uh, but the tragedy is that really the avant-garde or the rebel poets, they also tend to elitize themselves. There's something, I think, inherently competitive about poetry. I think also in, uh, even in China and Japan, historically, where like millions of people would write poems. Like To my knowledge, in um, Japan now, there are millions of haiku poets, and yet how do they organize themselves? There are haiku championships. There are haiku contests. And where they, uh, where they compete to be the best poet. So there's something, I don't understand why, possibly because it's just so easy to write poetry, that it tends to, to form itself very quickly into an elite. So all the beats, who originally seemed, you know, at least exteriorly, to be like a bunch of anybody's writing, you know, uh, with their pen up their asshole... They, uh, you know, very quickly there became the very great beats, the minor beats, the sub-minor beats. Um, so so, um, so I, I think that's in some ways uh, tragic that poetry tends to uh, uh, constantly form an elite. Because, uh, because some of it is somewhat arbitrary, I think. I realized that, yeah, that's what I do work on. I do work on making sure the reader sees it. That's something we learned from Olson. Um, to, to the, Olson t taught the heart to the breath to the line. You follow your breath, but it's the heart that gives rise to what the breath is. Um, and they're so interrelated. Think of the word inspire. Uh, respire, inspire. We don't have enough people on their computers. More computers. And more iPhones. Mm -hmm. So it's about it's about pe people are wedded so wedded to their technology wedded to their technology exaggerating their resume tweaking their age on a dating site and the person who ain't getting up to that alarm clock and what kind of excuses for not getting into work that day the fracking controversy we got to get in there. Uh, how about the little dogs in the pet shop window scratching for attention? People and dogs. Dogs have a costume party in Tompkins Square Park. The best dressed dog gets a year's supply of dog biscuits. These are the dogs. Where are the people? Why are our people dirty, smelly outcasts and our dogs bought beauty products and condos? This is a poem for canines, not homo sapiens. Homo sapiens sleep on park benches on Avenue A, while dogs are coddled by their masters. We lie down like dogs and get up like people. But who are the dogs and who are the people? And conversely, but look, I am a dog, see? Pet me, stroke my fur, and give me a place to sleep. Arguments. Friends consoling each other. What are friends for? People ask you uh, this week, what is your movie about? What do you tell them? Desperation and decisions. Like 
Kids rolling, dizzy, down a hillside, squealing. The earth is reeling through cold snaps and spells of freezing, through warm days, wild winds, mild nights, downpours. A world of gooey, gray, slush. Puddles reflect blue skies, as bright as the first purple crocus in a cool dirt garden. The skies are full of ducks and robins. People are emerging onto the pavements of a modern city seething with spring. Which young woman will show you the buds that tip the bare trees? Who will make a gift of a true promise, revealing which sprouts will be hyacinths and yellow daffodils? Basking in the rough breeze, weathering bluster, drizzle, chill, you can, you will, easily be a blossom. All love in human outbursts to the sun. I don't date smokers. I don't drive with drunks. I don't dance with gropers. And I don't hang with punks. I don't want a gambling man cause I need to keep my bucks. And I don't want a ladies man cause who knows who he loves. Slim pickings, I won't do no risking till it all gets going. I'll keep on dreaming. Slim pickings, girl, what were you thinking? Just when you stop looking, that's when things get a cooking. I don't have no blind dates. I don't have no young one. I don't have no New Year's plans and come to think of it, I don't have much fun. I don't see my soulmate and I don't have a hubby. I don't care what Cupid's saying and I don't read your Abby. Slim pickings, I won't do no risking. Just when you stop looking, that's when things get a cooking. Slim pickings, I won't do no risking. Just when you stop looking, that's when things get cooking. Ain't it the truth? Ain't it the truth? <laughs> So we have like over 100 liquor licenses in this small area. This area here is known as Hell Square. And Hell Square is really um, called that because it's almost impossible to live here because of the cost of being here. And the only businesses that can make it during this period of time are bars. So we end up with just bar after bar after bar. And liquor license after liquor license after liquor license. And the population is changing, the neighborhood's being pushed out not only the businesses, but the people. We had in this building right here, Taylor Mead, and this guy, Shaul, came along and bought three of these uh, buildings. Actually, Taylor was in that one. And what happened was, it was really just a form of almost murder. Taylor was 83 years old. He lived on the fifth floor. They'd emptied out the building of everybody, legally or illegally, but they forced everybody out. And so what happened was, they turned the whole building into a construction site. So it's not just noise from the from the neighbors, uh, neighborhood construction. It's, na it's noise inside your building. So you have this constant, constant noise of construction. You have dust in your apartment. They drill through holes through his wall, and that's how we treat the elderly. Taylor Mead was a Warhol superstar. He's an American icon. He's an important artist, and this is how disposable these people are. Now Bloomberg stands on the fact that he supports the arts. This was as close to a murder as one would ever want to get. 
and that's to an 83 year old man so that's for Bloomberg and his generosity towards the arts and saving the arts and like that okay so he's buying Alex Katz and maybe Jackson Pollock's and like that that's not supporting the arts the art comes from the ground up the art in America was from the ground he's buying w work that's already being processed developed uh, uh, given the certification that's what he's buying he's buying he's buying blue chips he's not buying art He's not contributing to anything, he's not creating anything, he's not mentoring anything. He's just doing business. So that's not supporting art. Robert Duncan was a very important teacher. He was magnificent. Duncan danced his teaching, all right? And he pulled ideas out of the air that seemed to have no relation and tied them together with a perfection that is possible only to God. It's a manner of concentrating on your art. Uh huh. There's a desperation. There's a there. desperation there. There's always desperation behind it. Can art. you can your mind go into that space where you can create, feel enriched on your own level, and enrich other people's lives? kind of like making a painting. I'm like working on it as we're going along because I had, you know, a general idea that I wanted to do a freestanding sentence on a shelf around a room that was kind of a poetic text. But I didn't just want it to be black and white words everywhere. I wanted to have kind of the visual, verbal, 3D mix between all the stuff. Which generally means, this is what we all are. A shadow of extreme volume. Exactly. What else are we? We're, we're mismatched buttons. <laughs> That's what we are. Tender buttons, as Gertrude Stein would say. I love tender buttons. I love Gertrude Stein. Freckles. You like the Measles. freckles? Yeah. Measles. Mesothelioma. I watch too much TV. <laughs> what materials are those for the head? Ceramic and glass and cardboard and wax. So someone would say, oh, cardboard, that's not a preservable medium, but then you... It's all card cardboard. It's a lot of cardboard. Rather fallopian. Mm. Fallopian. In Peron, I grew up wild and reckless in the land of desert nomads, in the arid lands that lie near the promised land and Egypt, that land of milk and honey they were saving for my brother, and the land of Pharaoh's bondage where my mother's kin were born. I lived my youth near Canaan and the slaving lands of Egypt. I lived my life an outcast in the desert of Peron. I grew up wild and stubborn, my hand against my father, at war with all my kinfolk, my kin at war with me. I grew up wild and skittish, like a scared colt in a sandstorm. I laughed at mules and camels that never could break free, but I learned to run in sandstorms, and how to eat my water, and how to find oases, and how to take the heat.
I learned to talk to demons, to tempters, and to genies. I learned to talk to devils, to outcasts just like me. I learned to love and pity my younger brother Isaac when they took him to the slaughter, not even asking why. God bade me make the manna for Isaac and his children. My demons said they'd be here, twelve tribes of them some day. In this land of desert nomads, near the promised land and Egypt, near the land of milk and honey, in the desert of Paran. We want to go much deeper. I see. It's an underground film. Right. And we want to go under the skin. I want to get the guy who doesn't wake up when the alarm goes off. I want to get grumpy people. I want to get people on the verge of a big breakup. I want to get kisses that aren't satisfying. You know what I mean? Yes, don't we all? I want the woman slapping the man and he can't fight back. I want a little I Ching. I want those midnight 4 a.m. ads on TV selling you what you really need in your life to turn it around. Oh, I would love to be criticized as being a cynic. I think I'm criticized for being a lightweight. No, I don't think I'm cynical. I'm from the Midwest. We're like happy, happy and solid citizens type of poets. <laughs> A wearing away of the peach fuzz of promise, the ominous frost, a layer of skin at the wit's end of lust, a lampshade of dust in a follicle frenzy, fabulous craters to tease our reminders, the flotsam of jetty, the frenzy of frogs. I look to the rest just to test the remainder. Thank you. Capricorn. It's easier to concentrate for the next few days. Write, express, and record. Creative work thrives now. Sidestep breakdowns and allow yourself to get distracted by love. So even the high end, so it's not just about the bottom end, it's about all ends. And so, you know, what used to be like a 99 cent breakfast, which meant that you could go there and, uh, you know, if you had three dollars in your pocket, you could impress the person you were with because you're buying them breakfast. You would have a breakfast. You had a, a choice of like eggs, however you wanted them, poached, fried, scrambled, over easy, over hard. Uh, you had uh, pan fries and you had a little orange juice and you had the uh, unlimited coffee and you had the opportunity to... Um, choice any kind of bread you wanted rye pumpernickel white so you had choices and so you would give the waiter a dollar that was a tip that's a big deal price of the breakfast you bought the other person uh, their breakfast and you had your breakfast so for three bucks you had um, you were able to do your business well now it's a uh, you know a twelve dollar brunch that's why uh, I had a show called the uh, sixteen dollar hamburger show went to a restaurant and um, had to look for a, a more inexpensive thing in the menu. The cheapest thing was a $16 hamburger and $11 beer. So that's how much it's changed. Okay, 
today. I'm, I'm wearing one of the helmets that Gary Azon and I wore as we demonstrated on Avenue A and E 7th Street as the police marched down, their shields raised against the artists and the poor and everyone else who was demonstrating at that point. Gary wore a helmet like this, Gary Azon, and it was actually his idea to, uh, to use these helmets, which I didn't really completely understand how necessary they were until I saw the police hitting people over the head with their nightsticks and the blood spilling out on the street. I knew that he had made the right choice. So uh, this was an actual helmet, in other words, that was worn at the demonstration in 1988. So perhaps you can get an idea of the fact that this was definitely a war zone. So if you think we were playing games here, or kidding around, or just just out for the afternoon lark or something, that is not what was going on. This was definitely a war. It was a class war, poor against the rich, and the rich won, obviously. And the reason why the rich won is because money rules our lives, our country, and hopefully it doesn't rule our spirituality completely, but it's a somewhat cynical approach, I suppose, but it has a lot of ring of truth to it to say that everything is made of money. The sky sheen is platinum, the October leaves are bronze, the farmhouse windows are glazed in crystal. Everything goes on is money. The supper hum from the houses is money. The hero moving past the dirt road to the tennis courts, he is about money. All the automobiles are beeping with it. The poem in which the hand is a blue flower. The words are a screen. It is about money. Money never has to take a sandwich for lunch. Money never cries or puts up with or flounders. Money will not save marriages or rotten novels. It will merely twist them into shape. Money is a postcard from the other side of the imagination. It's the aquamarine and the fake sunshine. Money has perfect knowledge of the world. It never cries, puts up with, or stretches. It never finds itself silly. Money never has to become arrogant or loving or grow gray. Money is, oh God, the true poet. That's one of the reasons you dig art, is its many possible meanings. Is that a question? Is it? Well, I don't know. Is it? <laughs> I asked you. Are you asking me a question or not? Was that a question? Um, yeah, and I usually, when, when asked that question, I say, a knuckle of butter, a dollop of cream, a splash of whiskey, a pinch of salt, and a smidgen of cake. That's what it means. I like that one. I like that one. I like that one. I like that one. I like this one. I like the skin on this one. Good skin. You work in black and white sometimes? These were all black and white to start with. But they're not black and white now. But they were to start with. And then if you look at the text going around, there's a lot of black and white. Oh yeah, text. Quite a bit of black and white there. Black and white. Well, text is so concrete, isn't it? Well, I think of Lawrence Wiener. Well, he's very colorful. I mean, most of his text is in color. But still, it's quite concrete. at an exhibition. 
went to the art museum to see some Van Gogh, dropped ecstasy at the first water fountain I could find, looked at crazy landscapes, jagged lines, swirls, sawtooth patterns, Van Gogh, had some unresolved issues, I could tell. Also saw some paintings by a guy named Chainsaw or Kaim Su, gnarly stuff, tortured portraits, got into an internal Picasso-Picasso debate. You know, you say Picasso, I say Picasso, then wondered what's the difference between Monet and Manet, got nowhere fast with that one, then got into that old abstract expressionist mnemonic, Newman shut the door, Rothko pulled the shade, Reinhardt turned off the light, very soothing but sketchy, saw a piece called Lady with Ermine and wondered if it was the last weasel painting, found out Chagall died long ago and couldn't believe it, got into some heavy denial, then accepted the death as sad, but not as sad as if it had happened yesterday or to a close relative, listened to a tour guide talk about repressed anger and the relative merits of paintings vis-a-vis -vis blank walls, sat at the Egyptian temple and felt the ecstasy really take hold, thought about the architect who designed that glass pyramid in Paris and wondered, if I am pay, who are you? Tossed a coin in the fountain and wished for domestic bliss. Tried not to look anyone directly in the eye, because if I did, they would know about the ecstasy, of course. But there were some young women I couldn't help looking at. In fact, couldn't help stalking from gallery to gallery. Felt like I was walking on clouds. Also felt like a criminal. Found my favorite statue, white slave. Nice demure bondage, smooth surfaces, skin-like effects. Went back to stalking, but all my original targets were gone. Found my way around the balustrade, the colonnade, and the balcony, looked for God in the details, then noticed all eyes were on me, went out basically the way I came in. Gemini, express your thoughts in words and send them out. Make connections and brainstorm creative collaborations. Death is a soldier watching TV. What he really is, is a middle-aged guy wearing camo who reads a lot of books on military history and dreams what the world would be like if Hitler had won the war. He sits in a neighborhood bar hunched over a white Russian watching TV. Every time he looks at the screen, something happens. A tsunami slaps Japan. A mudslide hits Argentina. A volcano erupts in Iceland. He nods sagely and sips his drink as these disasters occur in real time. Even as he stares at his now empty glass and wonders whether he should order another, his mind dances like an old typewriter carriage over a list of the living and each name he happens upon represents a life extinguished. This is hard work, he thinks. Yes, I'll have one more. I've earned it. I don't date smokers. I don't drive with drunks. I don't dance with gropers. 
And I don't hang with punks I don't want a gambling man Cause I need to keep my bucks And I don't want a ladies man Cause who knows who he loves Slim pickings I won't do no risking Till it all gets going I'll keep on dreaming Slim pickings Girl, what were you thinking? Just when you stop looking That's when things get a cooking But your shop, but your shop, but your seals Hiding your head in the cloud You took me to the amusement park Now who's laughing out loud? Bachasha, come out from the crowd We sparkled like a blade of morning grass like Jack and Jill, we climbed the hill, the morning passed. We tumbled into afternoon, so 